Greetings. Welcome to In Conversation with Trevor, brought to you by the Nyaradza Group. I go beyond the headlines and beyond the sensational. Today I'm in conversation with Dr. Olivia Muchena, former Zimbabwe cabinet minister. This is a part one and part two of a thought-provoking conversation. <music> Um, Olivia Muchena, welcome to In Conversation with Trevor. Thank you, Trevor. I uh, just finished reading a book, and uh, it's a powerful book. It's authentic. You, you, went, you, you decided to be vulnerable, to be candid. It's a book that I think, um, I have no doubt, uh, Anybody interested about the direction of our country and our continent ought to read. Those in business, those in politics, those um, uh, in, 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 in places of uh, faith. This is a powerful book to read. I want us to start almost at the end, and then we will walk back. And the end... Uh, for me in this particular moment is, and I'll quote from the book, uh, page three, where you say, my service in government was terminated in December 2014 and my political career came to a dramatic end in May 2015. I was expelled from the ZANU-PF party during the inter-factional paging of party members around succession issues on allegations of plotting to remove the president of the country and party by unconstitutional means, allegations which later on proved to be false. That's a powerful statement, God. Talk to me about that period of your life. You were a ZANU-PF member, card-carrying member, loyal member, and you get fired in these circumstances. Share with us that experience. Trevor, it was a, a fundamental, personal, as well as family, constituency, and part experience that we were going through. Uh, I wasn't the first to be fired. There had been other people, so it was like waves that we were going uh, through. But uh, what was uh, dramatic about it is, although we had been going through like stage by stage, uh, hearing things in the media, discussing things in meetings, until it came to the final point, you know, we were going along with mm -hmm. what was happening. And um, there were certain moments and times in that process that were very significant. For example, mm -hmm. we were at the Midlands State University graduation, and I was Minister of Higher and Tertiary Education, Science and Technology Development. You go through a ritual of robbing. There's a whole ritual yeah. that uh, accompanies graduations. So we are in this uh, tent, and uh, His Excellency, the President, uh, Mugabe, Robert Mugabe. Yes, mm -hmm. is uh, being robbed in his corner. We wait for him to finish robbing, then we come to the minister and so forth. And I could sense the tension, even at that moment. Without him saying anything? No, not even him, but... The people around. Right. So at some point, I uh, overhear one of the security persons talk to him about um, me having been uh, 
uh, having been recommended for uh, not firing, for removal from my leadership positions, a recommendation coming from uh, the province. I was uh, the political commissar of the Women's League. And so I had this little bit of conversation and um, uh, the president's reaction was, he just shrugged his shoulders. Of course, she knew it was coming. That was that. We had to go through the graduation ceremony. As if all was normal. Yes. And, uh, you know, genuinely, dutifully doing my uh, assignments. For example, it was very hot. And uh, I felt the president needed a fan near him. Mm -hmm. So I had to find ways of attracting attention and so forth. Anyway, it was done. On our way to Harare after the graduation, uh, we are in the car. Usually in the car, there are three of us, the driver, the aid or a security person, and myself at the back. And we have our radio on. I already know what has happened. I don't know about these two. I didn't tell them. And a news bulletin comes as was characteristic those days. It would start with like the latest expulsion. And uh, uh, my name was announced together with uh, another provincial leader. And uh, I could sense the tension of these two people in front of me and uh, like a painful tension and I, I just felt you know I could do something to to lessen the attention so I just uh, made a comment I said oh I hope you are not hearing this for the first time because I had heard it uh, before the graduation and they kind of relaxed a little bit, but it was a, a long mm -hmm. drive. I can imagine. And um, then the actual day of uh, first, I was fired from government. Yeah. My address at that time was my farm, which was driving distance I used to go back and forth from the farm. But at some point I had moved out and uh, one of my sons married with a young baby were living at the farm. And at about uh, 2, 3 a.m., you know, cars come flashing and they knock and so forth. Um, yeah, it disturbed them, it agitated them. Then they told, uh, they told them that, uh, you know, she's in, it's the Harare address. So as soon as they left, uh, we were um, alerted that there are people coming. So it gave me a chance to prepare. I didn't know whether I was coming to be collected and go wherever I was going. But uh, it gave me time to to adjust. In fact, uh, we also had uh, another couple at the farm, at the Harare address, who had a baby. So one of my family members suggested, why don't you stretch the baby on your back so that it gives you time to adjust and so forth. So it was dramatic in those senses. And when they came, they just wanted uh, me to sign uh, that I had received a letter. And this was about uh, 3 a.m. and so forth. And what is, what is the letter saying? And to say I was uh, relieved of my uh, duties as a minister because I was no longer 
uh, following the government. Uh, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know. And and then you get fired uh, from the party too. Is yeah. that another process? That's another process. I was at that time a um, senator by proportional representation. I had become a senator of Marshall and mm. East mm. Province. Mm. So I was still a member of Senate. And uh, that the firing from government was in December, and the firing from the party was in May uh-huh. 2015. So right. there was a there was period. A of, uh... Yeah. Now, so the letter gets delivered at 3 a.m. Mm-hmm. Did it have to be 3 a.m.? Could, could they not have waited for normal working hours? I, I can't answer that question. <laughs> so, tell me, what's going through your mind as the, the, you are told that they've been to the farm, they're now coming to your, to your place? What, what, what is going through your mind? It, it, it just describe to us what is going through your, your mind. Firstly, I felt for my children at the farm, having to go through this uh, traumatic experience. They are young people, they have a baby. It's collateral damage at its uh, worst emotionally. Mm. Yeah. And uh, secondly, as they are coming, I'm not, I don't know what they are coming for. But um, Trevor, there is something about having a living faith. When when I read about the peace of God which passes all God understanding, understanding. I, I've lived that. So I wasn't panicking like, uh, uh, what should I do? You know, all over the place. I just waited to see what was happening. Mm-hmm. And when I got the letter, were you worried at some point about your own safety? Not really. The day I would have been uh, worried about my uh, safety was when this whole discussion uh, started uh, at a Politburo meeting. I I cannot, because of the secrecy, sure. yeah, give the details, yes. mm-hmm. but... That day, I was worried, and I actually sent a message to one of my sons that I don't know what might happen. That day, I was worried, but subsequently, it was uh, long drawn. And uh, Wow. And you say allegations which you were later proved to be false. So you never participated in trying to... Um, get rid of Robert Mugabe unconstitutionally. <laughs> you laugh. Of course, of course. Explain to me why And you it's laugh. the same laughter, actually, that I did in the Politburo when that the accusation was raised. And it raised the anger of the president. And he says, yes, you, he saw my disbelief. You know, yes, you and uh, so to me it was that mm. so unsubstantiated, uh, such a an improbability of great proportions, knowing who I was, how loyal I was to the president, to the party, to the people of Mutoko South. But this is why people need to know politics, Mm -hmm. that they are games that you need to understand. So this was a game? Later on, I think it was in the public media, uh, one of the... People, main actors, saying, oh, it was just a political bunting, referring to how Vice President Mujuru had been uh, But this, this, is, this is a political game mm-hmm. that has raised your anxiety. Mm-hmm. You're worrying about your son who's on the, on the farm. You're worrying about the people that you're living with. What a game this is. Um, 
I know at the end you will ask me about uh, books, but one of the books that uh, I read in the early 80s and made an impact on me was uh, Games Mother Never Taught You with the subtitle Political, I mean, a Corporate Gamesmanship, uh, written by Betty Harrigan to women that if you are wanting to go into the public space, whether it's in academia, business, or politics, you want to break the glass ceiling, you have to know and understand that for men, it's a power game. It's modeled on the military, it's modeled on the sports, and because women are not socialized, uh, through sport or military, we start on ground zero as it were. So your firing is the other side of the bookend, and your hiring is a fascinating uh, part of the bookend, and you capture it very well. You say, a phone call came from the chief of protocol on that 15th day of April in 1995, sent me into a panic mode. The president of Zimbabwe, His Excellency Robert Mugabe, wanted me to report at the State House at 11 a.m. that morning. What had I done? Why did he want me there? And which is State House of the two complexes on Borodja Road? I asked all these questions at once without waiting for an answer. So you've been fired and you get to discover that these are political games that you were not equipped. You get fired, you're, now you're hired. You are as innocent as they come. Talk to me about that, the, the excitement, the anxiety is after the call as you process. You've been, you've been hired. Yes. You're a cabinet minister now. Yes, I didn't know that. <laughs> I'm coming from academia. I'm going into politics because I'm tired of common room political discussions and so forth. I am charged. I want to go and work with people of Mutoko South. I've won the elections, so I'm ready. I actually was, that particular morning, I was getting ready to go and see the chairman of my department. I was in the Department of Adult Education, and... Um, I was going to talk with uh, Dr. Machazi about having a timetable that the would... The late Dr. Machazi, yes. yes. Mm. That would uh, enable me to combine my parliamentary duties with my lecturing. Mm. And this phone call came. So when uh, the chief of protocol detected the anxiety, the panic, says, ah, don't worry, it might be something good, uh, you might be appointed as a deputy minister or something. And I went into even a greater panic. Why? I mean, I wasn't ready. I had not imagined myself getting into politics at that level. So... Anyway, the long and short is I get there and I'm appointed the Deputy Minister of Agriculture. Mm. So I had to mentally adjust and then go through the process of learning what it is to be a minister and a, an MP at the same time. My idea of going to Parliament was going to raise the issues of uh, Mutoko South in Parliament, and uh, I had a good track record of uh, debates from my school days, and I was just so excited. Lo and behold. Fast forward. Yes. As Nyaradzo, we strive to continuously bring convenience to our clients. Nyaradzo Group is proud to introduce Sawi, 
a new virtual chatbot assistant on WhatsApp. With Sawi, you are now able to interact with us from the comfort of your home and can be assisted anytime via WhatsApp. With life assurance products, diaspora products, applying and assessing your policy, payment platforms, claims information, and any other queries concerning payments, policy information, or products and services. Simply WhatsApp Sawi on plus 263-712-992892 or register and start interacting and receiving notifications from Sawi on WhatsApp. Now, join in and experience a new level of convenience 24 hours a day with Sawi. Yo, um... This book um, essentially captures the wisdom that you gathered from the knocks, um, from your experience, from that day when you are hired to the day you are fired, and many more. And like I said, it's so authentic, it's so um, uh, candid, you are vulnerable. It's beautifully written. It's so compelling. The, the, I must ask you this. Why don't we, why don't politicians at that particular moment, when the call comes and the president says you're a cabinet minister, and say, you know, Mr. President, I'm not ready. Give me time to be ready. Give me maybe two months or whatever. Talk to me about that crazy idea. I'm not <laughs> ready because you're not ready, hey? You are not ready. Why don't we say, now that you know what you know, Mr. President, I am not ready. Can, is there a school? Is, is there something that can be done to make me ready? Talk to me about this crazy idea that Trevor is uh, putting before you. You partly answered <laughs> that question. I'm not ready. Is there a school? You know, part of what Beyond the Book is going to do is to get people ready. Mm -hmm. And as a tester, an appetizer, we have an animation mm -hmm. of somebody saying doctors are trained for five, six years, wherever they come from, engineers for four years, nurses for so many years, and so forth. How long should or are politicians prepared mm -hmm. for political roles, mm -hmm. and where do they get prepared? Right. Engineers spend years getting ready. Doctors, teachers, accountants, all have to spend a significant amount of time in preparation to be able to execute their important jobs with excellence. Politics, though not considered a profession, affects everybody and everything else. How much time should politicians spend in preparation? In comes the next generation African political leaders. The Power of Preparation by Olivia Muchena. Here is a powerful book based on 20 years of personal experiences and observations in politics and government. This book is for aspiring politicians, especially the young, women, professionals, Christians, practicing politicians and other players. The book teaches the aspiring politician to check their motivations. Do you want to get into it for the fame, glam, and personal gain? Or do you want to serve your people? How much do you know about the different contexts of African politics and their impact on political behavior? The book will take you through the various contexts of politics and governance in Africa during different historical periods. In this book, you will learn about the pros and cons of being involved in politics. You will learn about the benefits of being in politics. And nope, <laughs> it's not about getting riches. You will also learn about personal development. In essence, this is an African politics playbook. The challenge for the Christian and the citizen is to be or not to be involved in politics. Is there even a choice? There really is not an option, except 
to choose your level of involvement. Whatever level you choose to be in politics, this book will guide you. You see, in the book, I liken uh, political involvement to married and family life. Yes, I do. There are very few places, institutions, where people are prepared. You go through training, mm. formal training, for marriage or family life. You either have some traditional mechanisms, but by and large, a lot of people, it's, they do what they have seen either their parents or other people do or do an on-the-job learning. Mm. So, I am saying, just as doctors who deal with life and death just as engineers who make these structures that can be life-threatening, imagine politicians whose activities, everything about politics affects everybody, and yet there is no intentional, deliberate training. I'm not talking of political science. I'm talking of the practicalities, the basic knowledges. Where does that training take place? We need it. As you were talking when you started, you are saying you had gotten tired of uh, university politics. I discovered that one place where there's terrible politics is the university. <laughs> the senior common room and whatever. And I'm, I raise that point because I'm wondering, are some of us born naturally politicians and therefore we don't need to be trained? Or is there a difference between being in the civil service, serving as a cabinet minister and being a, uh, a, 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 a career polit politician? Do they need to be trained or they need to be human beings who are grounded in the things that are important for the common good? Uh, the training that I believe is needed is uh, very basic and very practical, which whether you are born one mm. or you make yourself one, you do not know or don't have at the beginning, mm. to illustrate. Yes, I know there is a country constitution, but that there are three pillars of a state, the executive, which we call government, the legislature, parliament, and the judiciary system are like our three cooking stones where we balance our pot there are certain relationships which you don't know as an MP who has had the courage to run, but no information. Or you are in a civil service with regulations and so forth. Fortunately for the civil service, there are some countries with very well-developed civil service training. For example, uh, the French, I didn't know, that in 1794, as part of the French revolutionary processes, they established what they call the Grand Ecole. Mm. Civil to train civil servants for service and excellence. Definitely a trained civil servant, and we have varying degrees of training in various African countries, a trained civil servant knows how to operate. And here comes a minister. And this trained civil servant has to deal with this very important, very powerful person who doesn't know? Who is as raw as they come? <laughs> How government works. Mm. 
you said something again that I must uh, uh, go to. You say this person has had the courage to run, and and I want to 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 say to you, that's the problem we have in politics, uh, in the way our countries run. That the people with the courage don't necessarily have the requisite skills to lead. Yes. So we have in parliament. Uh, people, parliament and 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 uh, and um, municipality, people with courage, but without the wisdom, without the experience to lead. What's your pushback on that? Uh, that's why I am calling. I specifically said the next generation of African political leaders. Next generation meaning the young, mm. the women the professionals, the Christians, or whatever faith you have, and anybody who aspires to lead. to lead, there is a need for preparation mm. in order to be effective. Mm. You, you say something again which uh, I found interesting where you talk about being ostracized once you are fired. And uh, the perhaps one of the few people that came to your aid, and I was saying before we started that you and I have something in common. I was fired from being editor of the Financial Gazette. And when I got fired, I, was so, I, was, I said to myself, I have many friends, people that know me. The phone is never going to stop ringing. Um, I'm going to get calls, people supporting me. The phone never rang. And what you're saying here confirms that. The only person that came to see you was your reverend, uh, Reverend Ronnie Nyakuyengama. And he and other people came and sang hymns and prayed and quickly went away. What did you learn from that experience? Um, from the firing experience. Mm. Exactly as you describe it, that suddenly you have no other people except your family and those who might be going through the same experience. Uh, I may not be comfortable to mention sure, that uh, some of the people who were fired together with me there were three of us who, who met. Fortunately, they were always coming to my house, would make tea or a meal and eat and talk, but it was like reinforcing each other. Everybody else, remember Trevor, were being accused of wanting Serious crime. to remove that's treason. Mm, treason. And you know what the sentence for treason mm. is? Who wants to be associated with that? To remove of all the presidents, President Robert Gabriel Mugabe. So nobody wants to come. At first I used to to wonder what was happening if I go for a funeral or a wedding. I'm my usual bubble self, and I notice people are not responding. Then I'll say, oh, okay. Then I'll quickly go away. So there's that isolation. And then there are those few who dare, like my pastor there, to be seen coming in broad daylight to uh, give you encouragement. It was a heavenly moment. Mm. So one of the lessons that we draw from a firing experience is one, know the value of your family. Oh, wow. Know the value of your family. They stand with you. Good and bad. Yes. And then value those people and the friends who will dare to remain related to you? One of the things that uh, I find uh, uh, interesting, a lot of times, I meet people and they say, oh, 
how are you? Where have you been hiding? Excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> Did you come looking for me? I wasn't hiding. I go about my business. You were hiding in town from me. And so forth. So it's now I'm um, now the the one who has been hiding and not you reaching out to me. It's, human relationships are very important. And in politics, that's very important because political relations are not, they are usually functional. I get, I get you, get you. Um, but have we not been poisoned as a society that if I support Nelson Chamisa, I should not be seen with somebody who supports Emerson Mnangagwa? If I support Emerson Mnangagwa, the CIO are going to be behind me and say, why did you have tea with somebody who supports uh, Nelson Chamisa? For I find that so toxic. But that's reality, am I right? It is reality. And I would want to say a stage of political development. Okay. I say in the preface that uh, this book started as an international leadership foundation project mm. when I went through their uh, training program they required me to do a project and I decided to uh, evaluate their governance module based on my experiences. Mm. It was very important and uh, the leadership of ILO Professor De La Dadevu uh, who actually established the ALMA. Yes. Here. Right. Yes. We wanted this done. So I asked for an atmosphere to do it and finish it. I went to Ghana for one month on a working holiday. I was living with my niece who was working with the FAO. I had not realized that there were elections going on in Ghana uh, at that time. Trevor, mm. I was fascinated. I had to force myself to do what I had come for. Otherwise, I was glued to the TVs. They had like five independent channels, completely independent. <laughs> the debates, I mean, the government had also the TV channel and very good. And each of these five will have a panel of uh, MDC, Alliance, ZANU-PF, whatever, and they are busy discussing. Go into the street. There's so much traffic in Accra. Hmm? So as we are going, there are these vendors with a bundle of party re parties regalia. Yeah, yeah. So a motorist will call and say, give me that is an OPA mm. flag. No, I don't have. So and so, bring this Anupia flag here. Isn't Give that amazing? Me. I mean, are you, I was just, my mind was blown. My mind was mm. blown. Every aspect of that election. Yes, they had tensions mm. and one or two incidences of violence were reported. Mm. But by and large, it was just amazing. Mm. I learned a lot of things then. Growth and development takes place in all situations, circumstances, sectors, including politics. Mm. This parliamentary system that we have adopted mm. came via decapitation of king's heads, mm. You know, candidates used to be kidnapped. Mm. I'm talking of British. Sure, sure, I hear you. Yeah. Mm. But now we eulogize them as the beacons of mm. democracy. My, my plea is democracy is not 
one size fit all mm. is not instant coffee. Mm. We are moving or we are in a country, I, I put an anecdote there, where I illustrate through one day. Mm. I have been to Chije, very remote, very traditional. I come to Motoko Center, the growth point, a little bit of Eben. I go to Parliament. We are now in Parliament. Mm. I go to my ministry office. I go to, I go home, I pack, and I'm off to Los Angeles for mm. some big mm. meeting. Mm. So you see the spectrum of political understanding and operation from Chile to mm. Los Angeles. We can't take 500 years and the decapitations, but we can do a social engineering job. This is what is required in politics. Absolutely. And the AU has given us a template. A roadmap. Agenda if, if, 2063. If Ghana can do it, why can't we did it, as somebody said? <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> Let me get to, um, you're very clear about why you got into politics. Um, and posit this to you. Getting into politics, pure, innocent, with your vision why you get into politics. Has your experience not said to you that politics changes you rather than you changing politics? But first of all, why did you get into politics? One, as I indicated, I was tired of the common room politics. politics. And what I didn't uh, write, which is in another book, this is not my political life. Mm. There's a, a book coming yeah. about my Looking political. forward to that one. Yes. Is that I had been, you know, in politics before as a student. At one time, I was the chairperson of uh, ZANU for three big universities, Cornell, Rochester, and um, Syracuse. You know, exile politics and things like that. But that was nowhere near the ground yeah. politics. Number two, I am professionally trained as an adult educator. They call it androgogy. Mm -hmm to deal with adults' learning processes and stuff. So I wanted to apply my adult education and community development within the political arena and prove that it can work. Did you? Yes and no. Mm -hmm. Yes, in the sense that for the people of Motoko South, we developed certain things that were uh, contrary or not the usual. For example, I took a lot of time, hard time, to educate, to interact with people in Motoko South that this, we need to rely on ourselves and use the resources, whether they are government, community to do certain things. Mm. Don't rely on me as an MP to build a school or a clinic. Mm. Don't rely on me. I used to say it so many times at rallies that if, God forbid, going back to Harare, I get knocked down, mm. that should not be the end of your development or whatever efforts. You now know if you want this, you go to which government department, what do you do about this? And so, so yes. As Nyaradzo, we strive to continuously bring convenience to our clients. Nyaradzo Group is proud to introduce Sawi, a new virtual chatbot assistant on WhatsApp. 
With Sawi, you are now able to interact with us from the comfort of your home and can be assisted anytime via WhatsApp. With life assurance products, diaspora products, applying and assessing your policy, payment platforms, claims information, and any other queries concerning payments, policy information, or products and services. Simply WhatsApp Sawi on plus two six three seven one two double nine two eight nine two or register and start interacting and receiving notifications from Sawi on WhatsApp. Now join in and experience a new level of convenience twenty four hours a day with Sawi. The one thing that you in your being vulnerable in this book you tell the story of your son uh, asking for forty dollars to buy a gift for a teacher and you say why do you want forty dollars to buy a gift and the, your son says i want to buy a gift to for my for my teacher who is white who has stood by me and supported me as i was being criticized for what you as my mother in the government have done as part of the government for, relating to the land uh, acquisition that was taking place. And you say, I gave him the $40. He thanked me and left. Overcome with emotions and confusion, I rushed to my bathroom, knelt and cried for the pain I was causing my children because of my public office. Talk to me about that. Yeah. Um, collateral damage, especially on the family, especially on children, is one uh, inherent aspect of uh, political or public life, which we need to develop ways of dealing with. And uh, part of why I'm making myself vulnerable is to invite mm. that learning process. How do we deal with situations where you are maligned? I mean, horrible things are they out in the public domain without any regard of the impact to the children, whatever age. For example, while we were going through the land process, you know, remember I was Deputy Minister yeah. of Agriculture and lands was in agriculture. And part of my uh, involvement at that time initially when we were listing all those farms for designation was to help Minister Kangai do whatever papers needed to be done. I also had to interact with the Commercial Farmers Union. At some point I was made chairperson of uh, uh, the Zimbabwe Joint Resettlement mm. Initiative mm. that brought farmers, white farmers, and government to work out other ways of doing land reform, even while this was going on. I mean, just to persuade, to say, this is your farm. Mm. Take whatever corner you want, and we subdivide. You know, we were going through that. Mm. No sooner had you done that than you see some headline, which is totally against this. So all this was in the public uh, domain. And uh, oh, that's another book. Mm. My experiences of the land reform, because I was can, seven can we, can, years. Can we just get on to that, your experience of uh, the land reform without getting into who got what farm and so forth. Could this have been done differently? So here is the thing, and, and push back as much as you want. Land reform was important. We couldn't go on with uh, 
the manner in which colonialism or secular the Ian uh, secular regime had uh, had had uh, bequeathed to us land had to be redistributed in an equitable manner, but guided by the fact that is can travel produce is he a farmer is he trained, and it could have been done in a peaceful manner without any blood being shed. That's my that's my look at it. What's what's your pushback on that? Could could land reform have been done in a different manner? What would you tweak to make it look different from what from what we've had? Yes, land reform as it ended up happening could have been done in a different manner, and it was actually started in a different manner, Trevor. You and I, the people of our time, generations, knew that people went to war, not for one man, one vote, mm -hmm. but to get back the land. We actually had experiences of people being moved in our lifetimes from where they were to other places. Hmm? Fast forward. We get independence. We have one man, one foot. We have come. We want to now realize what this was about. all about. First, we have a clause in the Lancaster House Agreement that says you don't touch land for the next 10 years. Hmm? people are still simmering. Mm. Within these 10 years, we have what we call willing seller, willing buyer. Mm. Hmm? We actually went through that process. Yes. And what was being willingly sold were still the sandy soils of Mutoko, not the Chishawasha red soil hills where my ancestors had been moved from. Hmm? This is happening and slowly, mm. and the people who had been part and parcel, when I say people, I mean the population, yeah. especially the rural population, who knew what this was all about. Yeah. I say, so what was the war about, and so forth. Do you know that one of the first activities on land reform was uh, the late Vice President Muzenda going to um, uh, this place in uh, Marondera, rural place in Marondera, where the villagers had said, uh -uh, we can't wait for this government. And they had occupied long before the mm. land reform. Mm. And the vice president had to persuade them to go back so that we do this thing in a good manner. Mm. I think certain things happened in this whole process. One, there was a very strong belief in our white population that the British will come to their aid. It would never happen. It would never happen. So whatever willing seller, willing buyer, Zijiri initiatives, these were like cosmetic things. Mm. They were waiting for this thing to happen, mm. which did not happen. Mm. And the impatience is increasing. Mm. That process was a revolution in itself. Mm. Trevor, I don't know many revolutions True. that are bloodless. Mm. I am not condoning mm. the blood. But what I appreciate is it did not, it could have been worse than what happened. There were legal mechanisms put in place to acquire, to distribute, and even a tea party, if we are having a tea party, I can kick the table and the linen is spoiled. So things, there were things that went wrong, mm. but the intention, the processes had been designed 
to make it work. But is it not this where the issues that you're raising here become important, come to the front? Leadership, integrity, a steady hand. Leadership that is above the noise that is being created by the white people and the people wanting farms. Is that not where what you're talking about becomes important? It is important, and I believe we did get that leadership. What I uh, always want or hope, in fact, one of my um, sons wanted to do a longitudinal study of the land process from the time it began to where we are now and show what had happened. One of the things that uh, bedevils this whole thing, I'm sorry to say, to a media person, is the power of the media. For the seven years that I was in the two ministries that dealt with land, I learned the power of the media to create an image. Mm. And here I'm talking mostly of the Western media. Sure. It didn't matter what you did on the ground. The media would show what they wanted. And the objective was one. Mm. Don't you dare, South Africa, don't you dare Namibia, don't you dare do Latin America thing. do the same thing. In fact, late Minister Mdenge was told by his uh, classmate who was also foreign minister uh, in the UK that, Stan, we are going to squeeze you until your people rebel against you. Thank you for watching part one of my conversation with Dr. Olivia Muchena. Don't go away. Join us for part two.